Welcome back to our series of four videos on sizing simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame. In our previous session, we were using Excel as a preprocessor to calculate loads and to create a systematic method of recording the results from the sizing procedure. This is the second video, it's session two dealing with setting up the frame in multi-frame. Subsequently, we'll have a session three on loading the structure in multi-frame, wherein we use the loads that we generated in session one in our Excel spreadsheet as input loads to multi-frame. And then finally, we'll perform the analysis and sizing of the beams in multi-frame. And again, the analysis is all done by multi-frame uh, using the analytic techniques which are embedded in that program and so the sizing procedure involves you making intelligent selections on the size of the beam and knowing when you've found the beam that's the lightest that still satisfies the strength and stiffness requirements so <clears throat> in the previous video we talked about creating a spreadsheet which looks something like this. And you have done this previously in sizing steel beams from tables. Uh, this is slightly reformatted. And as a consequence to save you time, you will be provided this blank spreadsheet, which you will save off with your name uh, and the proper name of the file as was described previously. So you'll notice that the loads are all calculated. In particular, the loads that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that we said were inputs to multi-frame. Um, you'll recall we said we don't have to load the single loaded girders or the double loaded girders. Um, we don't have to load the primary beams because multi-frame automatically transfers the loads from the secondary or joist beams to the primary or girder beams. Uh, you'll notice here we have uh, columns of blank spaces. One has to do with sizing for stiffness and the other for strength. Both of those will be done by trial and error. The stiffness will be sized under unfactored live load. The strength will be sized under full factored loads, all gravity loads accounted for. Uh, eventually, you will fill this in, and it will look like the following. Um, in this case, I've put in all the sizes for the 30 by 30 example. Um, you won't be doing the 30 by 30, you'll be doing the 40 by 40 again. And as we mentioned before, one of the reasons why you're doing the same example using tables and then using multi-frame is to understand that the analytic methods are the same and that they produce the same results. <clears throat> so part of this is building your confidence that all these various methods are consistent and that they work together. In our uh, previous discussion, we talked about what was sort of the base case structure that you needed to analyze. It needs to have roof choice, a single loaded roof girder or single loaded roof primary beam, a double loaded roof primary beam. And then it needs to have those same things um, for the um, floor also. So we're going to generate that and I'll refresh your memory. We said everything in a plane like this defined by these three columns and these uh, boundary beams, which we don't have a name for, by the way. I'll refresh your memory. These are special because they're not just supporting the floor, they're supporting walls, and they have special loads associated with them. And to some degree, that would be true of these. Um, but we're going to go ahead and size these perimeter girders under just gravity loads from the floor with the understanding that once we account for the walls, we're going to have to adjust those some, somewhat. But this is in the terminology of multi-frame. This plane right here 
represents a frame and then there's another frame on the back side which corresponds to these members those two are called frames and those frames have one two bays and the frames are separated by a certain distance here and when you get into multi-frame multi-frame is going to ask you for that information also you'll notice in this case we have what we say are five of these interior secondary beams one two three four five that's how multi-frame has cast the language they're going to ask you how many of those secondary beams are they and they are not counting this or that as a secondary beam because they're saying this beam may have to support the gravity load of the wall or it might even be involved in some kind of rigid frame action with the columns to provide lateral stabilization so as a consequence you can't really know um, at this point in the design process what's going on with that beam so we're going to size these interior beams or the so-called secondary beams which sometimes are called filler beams also but we're going to stick with secondary uh, in the language of multi-frame so we're going to uh, try to figure all that out in the meantime though we're going to switch over to multi-frame and talk about some of the organization of the program now one of the things I have to apologize right off the bat here is you'll notice we have multi-frame we have a whole series of menus and then we have a whole series of toolbars or icon bars underneath the um, arrangement of the icon bars depends upon uh, what kind of screen resolution you open the program in um, and it also so things will move around for example if you squinch the thing down it has to keep all the icons and it doesn't automatically adjust the size of the icons so to keep them in place it rearranges them also on your computer or in the lab machines when you open up multi-frame there will be more of these toolbars than I'm showing here I kind of stripped away some of them because I want to simplify things um, and keep and keep as much real estate on my screen to show you the structure as possible but I'll try to go slow enough so that you can identify what these icons are about and by the way all these icons these tools can be accessed through these uh, menu bars up above and when the program first came out there were only menu bars and these icons have been added after the fact and to be honest in in many instances they have speeded things up again though it depends on what kind of problems you're doing um, which icons you want to display I find that some of them I almost never use and therefore I'd rather access them through the menus than to have them taking up space on my screen so <clears throat> let's go through some really crucial things if we go up here to window by the way you'll notice that there's there's are, there are seven different windows you can access one is called frame one's called data another is called load another is called result and another is called plot and then there's a calc sheet and a report the crucial ones generally speaking are going to be frame load and plot results by the way are just tabular results that get plotted so these two windows results and plot contain the same information they tell you what's going on in the structure once the analysis is done most people prefer to use the graphic presentation so plot is used uh, much more often than result but every once in a while I find myself going to the results window to get some piece of information such as the total amount of weight of steel in the final structure that I've sized frame is the window where you actually create the geometry of the structure and for many of you that will be the most interesting part because you care about the shape of your building and the spans and all those sorts of things uh, load is where you actually put the loads on the structure 
So one of the things that many of you will get confused about is you'll be in the frame window and you'll start trying to put loads on it and you can't figure out how to put loads and you'll get really frustrated. So you need to understand that these windows all exist and there's a reason they're all separated. Um, the input process and the icons and the, and the toolbars would become horrendously complicated if you were trying to do all these kinds of operations in the same window. It just it would become unmanageable in terms of the complexity of the visual information that would be assaulting you. So there's a really good value in having all these separate windows where there are certain tasks which are occurring in those windows, so it's such as creating a frame. When you're in that stage of the design process, you'd like to be focusing on that and you don't want a bunch of visual information having to do with loads or even at that point there's nothing in the plot uh, side of things that's of interest but having icons like that floating around would just become uh, visually uh, distracting. So um, we can go to the data window there's nothing happening there now because we haven't put anything in. We can go to the load window there's nothing happening because we haven't put any loads in. Uh, and so forth. So they're all blank, but we're in the frame window now. Now, there are icons for accessing that. This is the frame window, the data window, the load window, the results, and plot. And so they have all seven windows shown here. And I find this icon fairly useful because it saves me going up here and doing that. But um, that's something you could easily do away with if you're trying to reduce the number of tools that are visible up above. Other tools that are interesting is this is front view, right view, top view, and 3D view. And uh, I will warn you now I, that in the in all three of these views you can inadvertently drag joints and members which is when it first happens to you is horrifying and you have to make sure you hit the undo key when you do that. Um, if you'd like to avoid that problem you should work as much as possible in the 3D view and there's a tool here somewhere which I will find um, I may have trouble finding it, but somewhere there's a tool, Preferences. So you go to Edit, Preferences, and where it says Drag Nodes in 3D, click that off. Drag Elements in 3D, click that off. That means if you're working in the 3D mode, you can safely uh, sort of fly around with your mouse and you won't inadvertently grab a member or a joint and move it. Where that's most disastrous, by the way, is in some immensely complicated geometry. You might drag a joint or a member a little bit out of place. Maybe it's enough that you can't really notice that you did it, but it gives you screwy results and in the end gives you wrong member links and a bunch of other problems that could be horrendous if the building actually gets built based off of your computer information which more and more is going to become the case by the way um, people are going to be using tablets they're going to be using uh, BIM software and using tablets um, at the site to build things from what's there. Also, we now fabricate things from our computer software. So it's pretty important that we have proper snaps and that we know that every joint is exactly where it's supposed to be. So avoiding inadvertently messing up the geometry of your building is pretty crucial. And I like to turn these uh, drag functions off. I don't know why they would have ever even been put in there because they're just annoying and distracting. Okay, so uh, that takes care of windows. This takes care of views. There are some other functions on here that are sort of common, like, you know, save and, and open a folder and undo and so forth. Those are all things that will be familiar to you. There are also things here like add member. So I can add a member. I can go edit the endpoints of that member in some way. I can change the geometry any way that I want to. And 
for most of the work I've done in my life, I tend to start this way. I'll just throw a member in. Um, so let's say I said uh, x equals 0, z equals 0, and y equals 15. And then I'll make the bottom of this uh, 0 everywhere. So I have at the origin a 15 foot tall column. I'm going to hit control total, by the way, to show the entire structure. So I have that column, and then I have all kinds of things I can do with that column, like I can uh, uh, duplicate it 30 feet out in the x direction, and then I can duplicate it in the z direction, and so forth. I can also give it a slope, so I don't have to uh, just deal with vertical elements. For what we're going to do today, though, we're going to design and, and analyze a really simple structure. And so, in order to do that, um, we're, we're going to uh, use one of the functions that's specifically designed to do it. So, we're going to go up here to this, which says Generate Frame. And it comes up with some things that we need to fill in. And uh, just to refresh your memory, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say, we said we had a frame of two bays. So this is one, two, and then we have two, ba two frames in order to create the complete structure that we need. So given all that information, I'm going to go back to multi-frame and I'm going to say the number of bays is two, the number of stories is two, the number of frames is two, the base spacing is 30 feet, the story height we said was 15 feet and the frame spacing is 30 feet, 30 feet. And then for the number of secondary beams we said it was 5. So again I'll refresh your memory. The secondary beams are this one, 2, 3, 4, 5. These don't count because we know they have some special functions that we have to account for. So we come back to this and then there's tertiary beams and as we mentioned um, it's pretty rare that you have tertiary beams. You either have a very large very complex structure or you've just designed it poorly where you have way more beams than you need. So pretty much for everything we're going to do in this class you will have no tertiary beams. You'll only have secondary beams. Um, you can adjust the secondary beam direction, but we're going to go with the default of the x-axis. And when we do that, we get a structure that looks like this. And keep in mind, we're in this uh, so-called front view. We could go to the right view, and it looks like that. Or we can go to 3D, and it looks like that. And generally, as I said, I tend to work in the 3D view because... Um, First of all, you can see more of what's going on and make sure that you're not inadvertently selecting things that you don't want to select. But also, we turned off the drag and drop function, so we're not going to inadvertently screw up the geometry of our structure. You'll notice along the side here, there's a bar with a handle. If you grab that handle and move it, you can tilt the structure that way. If you come down to the bottom, you can rotate the structure around. One of the things you'll find very annoying immediately is that it's rotating around the origin and the origin was set off at one corner of our structure. So when we go to rotate it, the building just sort of disappears from our field of view. So I'm going to hit Control T to put this in the field of view. Then I'm going to hit Select All and I could, I could also just lasso everything uh, in the following manner lassoing to the left, as in the case of AutoCAD. Anything you surround or cross over, it picks. On the other hand, if you lasso to the right, um, if you don't lasso all the way around it, it doesn't pick it. So, lassoing is a, a good way to grab hold of things. Um, there's another lasso function that I'll show you here if I, I may have... Uh, no, here we go. We're in the surround or rectangle selection tool. We can go to a linear tool where we do something like this. 
Uh, typically, though, we're going to stick with the rectangular tool. Right now, we're just going to hit Control All because we want to move this entire thing. So we're going to go to Geometry, Move. And now I want to move this structure so that the center of the structure is at the origin. So the center of the structure right now is at z equals 15 feet and x equals 30 feet. So I'm going to put minus 30 feet for x, minus 15 feet for z, and now when I hit control T, I see that my structure is centered over the origin. And now when I go to rotate it around, it doesn't disappear off my screen. And I like that a lot better. Okay, so just in a flash, we have a structure. At least we have the geometry of the structure. Now, the lines that are drawn here, by the way, are going to be the center lines of whatever members we put there. And this is one of the things that's kind of difficult for architects to deal with. Because architects like to say, well, the top of a certain beam is at a certain elevation. And eventually, from an architectural point of view, we have to make it that way. However, from a structural point of view, everything that's calculated is calculated off the center line or the so-called so -called centroid of the member. And as a consequence, what we've drawn here are the lines that represent the centroids of the member. We'll do all the analysis, do all the sizing, and then we'll have to move things around a bit, adjust the lengths of things, in order that the tops of the, of the beams occur where the architect wants the tops of the beams to occur. So there's a kind of back and forth between the essential language of architecture where we have certain ways of specifying dimensions of things so that they're easy to build in the field. I mean, the last thing you want to do in the field is to be working everything off the center lines of beams and have your floors occurring at all kinds of oddball dimensions depending upon the dimensions of the beams that are generated by your structural engineer. So your structural engineer is going to have to worry about all these issues of the center lines and eventually you and the structural engineer are going to have to work it back and forth so that your floors occur where you want them to occur and the tops of the beams occur where you want them to. Right now though, we have a 15 foot uh, floor to floor dimension which is from center line of member to center line of member, which may not even result in a 15 foot floor as things are currently laid out because the floor beams might be deeper than the, than the roof beams uh, in which case the dimension from the floor surface to the roof surface may not be 15 feet. All we know is the center line to center line dimension is the same. Now we don't have a complete structure here of course because we have to specify these beams and we don't draw the beams because the beams have to come into this program with all kinds of physical properties which are uh, crucial to analyzing the structure and understanding how the structure behaves. As a consequence, um, this tool has contained within it all the section properties that we might want to draw on, including every steel section that is manufactured anywhere in the world for all intents and purposes. And the reason for that, by the way, is the world has been the supplier to the United States for the United States steel products. Our steel industry was ahead of the rest of the world. When they came on board, they basically copied what we do. So what we do may not make any sense in the metric system, for example, but they do it the way we do it. And uh, pretty much, to my knowledge, there are no special sections that have found wide acceptance in the world that didn't start in the United States. So. Uh, you may need to use different codes if you're designing for Japan or Australia or whatever, but the, the steel sections that you'll be using will be the same. So we have sections built in. We also have various manipulations that we can do for, for things that are um, involved in the structure. So let's start off, and we're going to um, 
first of all, we have to support this structure. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight and I'm going to lasso from left to right and pick all the base points. So you'll notice how these points have gotten darker and we have to support them. We could support them with a roller joint like so. Um, excuse me. Um, this is called a horizontal roller in the language of multi-frame, which means it's producing a vertical component. We could put that in there, and under gravity loads, that's theoretically all that we would need. Um, chances are good that multi-frame won't let you do that analysis, because multi-frame will be looking at you and saying, really? You're going to have a structure that has absolutely no horizontal restraints on it? And that's kind of a multi-frames way of saying, we think you might need to think more about this structure because we think you might not understand what you're doing. So we can't just put a roller joint there. Um, we similarly don't really want to put a pin joint. The pin joint, like the roller joint, will provide the vertical component to resist gravity loads. And by the way, we're just starting initially with gravity loads. so. In our minds, theoretically, we could have a roller joint there and do all the gravity load analysis um, and, and not worry about it too much because we know that we're going to come back afterwards and put some sort of lateral restraints on it. But multi-frame doesn't know that we're smart enough to do that, so multi-frame is just basically saying, look, you got to put some horizontal restraints. So we could put pin joints. Eventually, we will have trouble with that, though, because we're going to have some other uh, pin joints or releases in the system and we don't have any lateral bracing built in yet and so to make our lives simple we're going to go up here and we're going to put a fixed joint and what that means is it supports it again in the y direction the z direction the x direction and won't allow the columns to flop over and that's kind of the minimal amount of restraint that we have to put in in order to do our gravity load sizing of the beams Eventually, of course, we're going to account for lateral forces from things like wind. And uh, at that point, we probably want a lot more restraint than just moment joints at the bottom. And we may not even want to rely on moment joints. We probably will want to rely on some kind of cross bracing or something else. But uh, in the meantime, just to get us through this gravity load sizing process, if we put moment joints there, we'll assure that our building doesn't just flop over and multi-frame will be satisfied that we're not incompetent or insane and will let us proceed with the analysis. Now, um, most structures uh, that we put together out of steel um, are connected together in the following way. Here we have uh, what we've been calling a clip angle connector or a clip connector. If this was an angle welded to the column and attaching to the web, it would be called a clip angle. In this case, though, it's a fin that goes all the way through the column. So it's a clip fin. And basically, the fin is grabbing hold of the web member to provide the vertical support. But there is no engagement of the flanges with the column. There is no engagement of the flanges across the column. So this would be considered a pin joint. Um, certainly at least where the where the members where the beams are concerned interestingly enough though in practice the column goes all the way through the joint so the upper part of the column and the lower part of the column are not pin jointed relative to each other but they're moment connected relative to each other so if we want to communicate to multi-frame that we have a structure like that multi-frame has a way of accommodating that and that's the following in multi-frame, we could have picked a joint here, like that joint right there, and we could go over and make that joint either a, a moment joint or a pin joint. But we don't want to do that because the column is continuous through that point. So um, we have to somehow release the ends of the beams while allowing the column to be continuous through the joint. And there's a way we do that. We're going to go select member slope horizontal. That selects all our beams. 
And by the way, again, we could have done that by doing some kind of lassoing operation like that. So we could do it for top and bottom, but it's so much faster to go select. Member slope, horizontal, and that picks all of our beams. And then we're going to go up here to the frame menu. And we're going to go down and we're going to say member releases. And when we do that, it allows us to have no releases, which is the default. Um, or we can release both ends. And if we pick that icon, it's re releasing the moment, uh, resisting the rotation at the end of the beam about a Z axis or we can release the moment that's resisting rotation about the y-axis and basically this clip fin is so weak that it's unable to generate in any significant way either of those moments so that's the option we're going to pick and we're going to pick it at both ends of the beam we have an option to just do it on one end but clearly we want to do it on both ends when we do this, you'll notice that there are some open circles at the ends of every one of those horizontal members. And those open circles are the warnings to us that the ends of those beams have been released. If you don't release those beams, you will get completely erroneous moments that are occurring uh, between the beams and the columns or between um, beams connecting into the same point and uh, your sizing procedure will be completely wrong and your diagrams will look wrong so it's pretty crucial that you do this stage of making those member end releases now we've done the restraints at the base we've done the member end releases the only thing we have to do to get ourselves started at this point is to um, put some member sections right at the moment we don't know uh, what those sections are going to be and we're going to be guessing at them and this initial guess is a really wild guess um, we could go through and guess every one of them differently because we know that the secondary roof beams are different from the primary roof beams which are different from the secondary floor beams and so forth but initially just to get this process started we're just going to pick a single section for all of those and um, you just have to do that because multi-frame, if it doesn't have a member there, it says, I don't know what you want me to do. I can't analyze this without some starting point. So tell me what your guess is and I'll do the analysis for you. And I'll do it so fast that you can make another guess right away if it's not what you want. So literally in less than a second, multi-frame will do this analysis for you. All right, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a beam and uh, initially we're going to just start with our guidelines our guidelines were well l over 20 is a, a good starting point for a steel beam and we know that all these beams are 30 feet long so if they're 30 feet long and we divide by 20 that's a foot and a half deep or in other words an 18 inch deep beam so again we're going to go up here we're going to select member slope horizontal and then we're going to go uh, insert a beam and there are several places that we can do that here uh, assuming that I didn't uh, remove that icon and I may have hmm okay well I'll go get that back at some point because Okay, so there was a missing toolbar. I went to view toolbar and put up member tool. So when I do that again, I'll go to view toolbars, member toolbars, and you'll notice it shows up right here. And uh, I'll give it a little more space so that you can see what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> so you'll notice there's a, a little icon there that looks like a, an eye cross-section. 
and when you uh, hover over that it says section type. Now here's another place to get at the sections library is in that window but I can't do it until I have uh, some members selected so I'm going to go back and pick member slope horizontal and now I can go here and I can get to the sections library either there or there. I'm going to go here for the moment and we said we were looking for an 18 inch deep wide flange so you'll notice by the way this comes up with the steel sections first and it always comes up in the wide flange library so here we see a W indicating a W section or the W group over here we have the sections here's a W44 by 335 <clears throat> that means its nominal depth is 44 inches and it weighs 335 pounds per foot down below that we've got some miscellaneous some standard sections they, these were the original I sections which we use only for limited applications now because almost everybody has gone to wide flanges here are some T sections cut by splitting W sections in half or T sections created by uh, creating uh, by taking miscellaneous sections and splitting them in half here are channels, miscellaneous channels. Um, these are H sections that are used as piles. In that case, the web and the flange are the same thickness so that when they're driven into the ground, the web doesn't tend to buckle. We have angles, double angles, pipe, and square tube, rectangular tube, HSS round, which means hollow steel section round, HSS square which means hollow steel section square, hollow steel section rectangular, and so forth. And by the way, square tube and HSS squared are um, essentially the same thing. Um, HSS square is the more modern terminology, and there are just tiny, minute differences, but also there are far more HSS square sections than there are square tube. They are both listed here though because some people are doing retrofits on old buildings and they want to be able to pull up the old square tube library because they're trying to change or alter an existing structure which has that uh, type of section with that kind of nomenclature. But in your case you're always going to be going to for new construction HSS round, HSS square, HSS rectangular and so forth. There are a bunch of other stuff down here, but we don't need to dwell on that right now because we're looking for a wide flange section that's 18 inches deep. So we're in the wide flange group. And we're going to scroll down here. And eventually we're going to come to the W18s. And here we have the lightest one is a W18 by 35. We'll pick that. Um, that'll be undersized for some of these members and oversized for others. Um, but we've now assigned that section, which you see right here, by the way, uh, W18 by 35. And if you wanted to render this, by the way, you'll notice here is the rendering tool. So we turn that on. And I'm not quite sure what's going on with this right now, but ooh, that's weird. Okay, well, you, you heard me mention earlier, there may be some graphic glitches in this software, and this looks like one of them. So we're going to have to figure out whether we can fix this or not. So we're going to go on pause for a moment while I work. Okay, so as is classic with computers, every once in a while something gets screwed up and the best thing to do is turn it off and turn it on again. In this case, what I did was I saved my file, closed out multi-frame, opened multi-frame again, and all the graphic techniques were working fine. Um, and this actually seems to be the cure-all for any graphic problems that occur with multi-frame is close the software and then open it again. So now we're going to go select all the member slopes vertical and we're going to give this uh, some columns. Now initially I'm going to give these monster large columns and I'm going to go up here and I'm going to either click here for section type 
or click here um, <clears throat> and pick section library, either one. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to pick a W14 by 808. Now, the 14s are the most common column element, and the reason is that a 14 is big enough for a standard floor-to-floor -floor spacing in, say, a multi-story high-rise building. Um, it's large enough that um, we don't need to go to something dramatically larger to avoid buckling, but we may need to go to something really thick. So you recall that when we talked about rolling eye sections, we said um, we, we have places we can stop along the way where we have a really thick jumbo section and we can use that for columns uh, at the base, for example, of a hundred story building. Or we can keep rolling and rolling until we get fairly thin flanges and thin web, in which case we can use those uh, for more lightly loaded columns or for beams. But the W14s are the most common column size, and there are huge numbers of different sizes of sections. We're going to pick the heaviest W14 there is, which is 808 pounds per foot. That's going to have like four or five inch thick flanges, and it's not going to be 14 inches deep. By the time the uh, full thickness of those flanges is realized, it might be 22 inches in one direction, 20 in the other. The key point is it's a good fat section and I'm choosing it in this case for the following reason. We're going to be looking at deflection of the beams and trying to isolate beam deflection independent of what columns are doing. So if we have some columns that are shortening, those columns are going to be adding to the deflection of the beam because the columns are supporting the beam. If the columns get shorter, then it appears that the deflection of the beam is greater. We would just like to isolate out the behavior of the beam itself. So I'm picking a super fat column, which will shorten very little. We will eventually replace this column with something more appropriate. But for the moment, I'm going to pick this particular section and click OK. So we have huge columns. Um, which, as we say, we expect that they will not shorten very much. So we now have a complete stable structure coded into multi-frame. It's not the final design because we have to resize all the members. And so we're going to start with this frame, which was constructed in the frame window, by the way. I'll remind you that this little icon leads to the frame window. Um, we're now going to take this file and we're going to go to the load window and uh, start to select members, create load cases, add loads, and so forth. And then we will uh, then take that and go and analyze it under various load cases. And then we'll look at the plot window to see, for example, how much deflection we have under live load or what sort of internal moment stresses we have under full factored load. And we'll start adjusting the size of beams. Uh, and eventually, of course, we'll also look at the sizing of columns. But columns will be involved one way or another in all of our lateral bracing. And so the sizing of them is going to become a bit more complicated. Right now, though, we can focus on our beams, which are primarily there to resist gravity loads. So um, our subsequent lectures will address those issues. So that ends our video on session two, setting up the structural frame in multi-frame which is part of our four session uh, series of videos on sizing simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame.